highly skeptical. And in fact, I was highly skeptical. I didn't believe this myself. I was shocked. I, I wanted to hear more about it. I was delighted to hear more about it. I kept pursuing the story and finding all its details out. And I kept being intrigued by the increasing positive results that never went away. Yes, they were irreproducible in certain ways. And some problems still exist, but I began to see that no way were we going to erase all of the experiments. And whenever in science you see an anomaly, that is the th something that conflicts with your normal understanding of how things work. That's the time to take action and really thoroughly investigate the problem. The shocking thing about this story is that the combination of the hot fusion community and the skeptical, and I would even say bigoted, physicists and others, and certain very problematic media types, who combined forces, not in a smoke-filled room, but in an evolved conspiracy, you might say, to kill this, to make it seem as though this is a joke. Okay, well, and it's not. a quote there that you refer to from Arthur C. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke, who's a noted uh, science fiction writer mm -hmm. and, and uh, an engineer, engineer, a variety of different things actually. Arthur C. Clarke, uh, but you have a great uh, Clarke quote in the front of the book in the preface, uh, and he identifies that as the preconceived idea of impossibility, and that is what you uh, lay the problem at the doorstep here. That's right. As a result of it's very common in the history of science for even good scientists to say that something is impossible. Uh, flight was stated by the famous astronomer Newcomb even just years, a few years before the Wright brothers flew. He said, it is impossible for man to fly with a heavier than aircraft and so forth and so on in a controlled flight. And lo and behold, they did it. Then when he did it, when they did it, and he found out about it and it was ultimately proved, and it took many years, by the way, for people to really believe that flight had been accomplished, five years, something like. Uh, uh, before that happened. Some then, don't believe we landed on the moon. That's right. Well, <laughs> Newcomb said, well, he'll never put a passenger on board. Okay? Rutherford himself, who investigated and was a pioneer of the very nucleus uh, he, uh, of, the, of atoms, he found out that there was such a thing as a nucleus. He said that nothing would ever come of nuclear energy. That the, anyone who was talking about getting energy out of these nuclei was talking moonshine. Okay, over and over again in the history of science, we hear skeptics who should know better. And in the case of, of cold fusion, whatever it turns out to be, and I'm convinced it's a nuclear reaction of some kind, a new character, and there are, by the way, theories now to explain it. Mm -hmm. All right, it's not as though I'm just saying, and others are saying, of the hundreds of scientists who are still investigating this, that, oh, we just think it may be nuclear. There's a lot of reason to believe that it is. The energies coming out per atom are much too high for any known form of chemistry. That's the basic bottom line. Now let's go to uh, uh, Fleischmann and Pons here and talk. And thinking about Clark's quote on the preconceived idea of impossibility, Fleischmann and Pons helped that process by by the way they came to market. Not not the way they came to market, but the way the unusual way they brought their research uh, to the attention of, of the public. I mean, there was no uh, presentation of information to normal scientific ch channels, journals, right. or peer right. review. Or well, why? Let, let me just explain. It's a very complex story, longer than it would, could be mm -hmm. described. Really, uh, on this show, you could devote the whole show to that complexity of the events that led up to that announcement. Mm -hmm. To some extent, th there's no question they were pushed into that announcement. They really didn't want to announce it then. There was something like 18 months more work that they felt they really wanted to do before they made any sort of announcement. Now there were patent considerations and so forth, and there was competition with another group that they had found out about. At BYU. At Brigham Young University, amazingly, only 45 <laughs> miles away. Steve Jones, a physicist, who was working on another kind of cold fusion for years, which is a more conventional and fully understood kind of cold fusion called muon catalyzed fusion. Uh, he had some ideas which were similar to theirs, although he didn't believe and doesn't believe today in the excess heat that's coming out. But nonetheless, they announced, okay? But by the way, they had submitted their article for journal publication, and it was accepted before they made the announcement to the Journal of Electroanalytical Chemistry, all right? Uh, now, what I do seriously fault them for, though, is on that very day, that they announced they should have had a stack of scientific preprints for any scientist in the world who wanted a copy, they should have gotten a copy. 
Absolutely. And the other thing was embodied in their paper. They did have errors in their paper. I don't have problems with the fact that there were errors and mistakes because any revolutionary discovery may well have mistakes mm -hmm. and misinterpretations and problems in its first paper. And it was a rather sloppy paper thrown together. However, its heat results have stood the test of time. But what they should have said very high up instead of way down in the text, they should have said, we don't understand this at all. We believe that it's a nuclear process because how can you get so much energy out of a, a, a system without it being nuclear? Well, and the presence of tritium and neutrons. Well, they also, did claim to have tritium, yes. Now, they were wrong on their neutron measurements, as it turned out. They may have been correct on their tritium measurements. But, but my point here is that a chemical reaction could not have produced right. either tritium or neutron, That's although could have produced heat. Could have produced heat, but not heat in the amounts that came out in that experiment and in subsequent experiments which have been successful in duplicating their work. Which and is in a fact, four to one ratio? Way beyond that way in many cases. Mm -hmm. Let's just talk about the basic problem here. If you have a system with a bunch of atoms, such as palladium rod and heavy water and so forth. Typical atoms chemically stuck together with their electron clouds stick together with a certain energy, which scientists call electron volts, several to 10 electron volts per atom. All right? Now, if you completely vaporize a system, get rid of, you know, boil it, as it were, it takes a certain amount of energy to do that. Uh, the energy of coming apart of all of these atoms, these tinker toy pieces just being pulled apart due to their stickiness together, due to the electrical forces of their clouds of electrons. The kinds of energies that have come out per atom in cold fusion experiments add up to hundreds to thousands of electron volts of energy per atom. So it's way beyond normal chemistry. Now the skeptics say, oh, they've made mistakes. There's a problem. They've stored energy in advance, and then they release it, and so forth and so on. Yes, on day one, and in the beginning, this was very much a concern, very much a question. But now it comes to pass that certain good laboratories that spent, like Stanford Research Institute, and uh, the people at Texas A&M University, Hans and Fleischmann themselves now have really very clean results. They get out energies which are far beyond chemistry, and there's no mistaking what's coming out. Well, there are well, no bookkeeping to errors us, anymore. But, but explain to us the problem in terms of the public reaction. Okay, okay. Pons and Fleischmann come out, they're immediately uh, assaulted. set upon, assaulted, <laughs> assaulted attacked. attacked by the called frauds. Uh, primarily problems. the physicists yes. and primarily the big money institutions. You bet. Now, big money and hot fusion. Big money and hot fusion. Yes. Now Georgia Tech and and A and M came out early with the uh, with replications, but then reta retracted. Right. Them. They had mistakes. They had well, errors. But so, what happened? Some of their groups. I identify uh, what happened in the in the immediacy in following. The imme in the immediate month or two following the announcement, there was chaos. Okay. Le because of their the very uh, strong scientific credentials of Pons and Fleischmann. As chemists. As, as chemists. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin Fleischmann's a fellow with the Royal Society. Mm -hmm. No one could deny that these were serious people, okay? And they had good scientific backgrounds, okay? So, therefore, they were making a claim that looked simple enough for lots of people to duplicate. And, and lots of people all over the world, literally thousands of groups all over the world, uh, tried to reproduce it. Some ended up being very frustrated and not getting results. Others got results and subsequently went on and continued to do research in the field and continue to this very day to do research in the field in India, in China, in five U.S. national laboratories and so forth. But in the beginning, there were lots of false starts. People jumped the gun. A guy at Georgia Tech said, oh, I found neutrons. He had a faulty detector, temperature sensitive detector. People at Texas A&M, one group there, said, oh, we have heat. It turned out they had a loose wire. 